It's been 21 months since Britain went to the polls and 1,269,501 votes decided that we were going to leave the European Union. And it's safe to say that a lot has happened since then. Against a backdrop of stagnant wage growth and crumbling neoliberalism across the global north, Donald Trump won the US presidential election. Jeremy Corbyn robbed Theresa May of her majority and Jay-Z confirmed that he did actually cheat on Beyonce. All the old orthodoxies are shattered is basically what I'm saying. So, with exactly a year to go until Brexit Day, I'm here in Keithley for Cambridge Analytica. I mean Navarra Media, to find out about people's political priorities in a constituency which voted Leave in 2016 and swung from Conservative to Labour in 2017. I want to find out how issues around immigration, race and belonging play out in the city of Bradford. With over 30% of the population aged under 20 years old and 63.9% identifying themselves as white British, the district is young and it's diverse. But concerns around community cohesion have endured since the so-called race riots of 2001. Three of the district's neighbourhood make up the national top 10 for areas in which a minority, faith or ethnic group make up the majority of the population. With one in three people here aged 16 to 64 out of work and funding slashed for community and language centres, I want to know if the progressive economic platform offered by Corbyn's Labour Party is enough to mitigate against the allure of nationalist anti-immigration politics or whether a mistrust of racial and ethnic others goes deeper than one's immediate economic conditions. Exactly a year until Brexit Day. How do you guys feel about Brexit? None of us quite understand what they're going on about Brexit, this Brexit, that. I really do not like the idea that we're going into Brexit. I feel that we made a wrong decision. For me, um, I think we should have more control. I don't see the point um, having leaders all the way in Brussels. I'm not exactly happy about it. I think it's um, a very silly decision. Very slow, yeah. It's a bit shit, <laughs> I would say, yeah. It's not going too well, but I'd be glad when we've got out of the coma market. Anxious, like, I mean, there's so much... Like every day on the news there's something new, I mean, some sort of disagreement. It should have been more rapid and gone quicker than what it is, you know. I don't really feel anything at the moment because I think because nothing's really happened yet. I don't think that it's a very smart idea due to the fact that for years we've been in the EU and we've been involved with them, we've been getting products and things sent over from places like Germany and that's going to all stop because they're not going to give it to us now. And I think it's just, in reality, I think it's a joke that people actually thought that this was OK. That I, I don't understand how anybody could think. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, well, it's getting rid of all these foreign people. Well, no, it's actually not because they are actually probably married I've, I've got kids and they're allowed to stay so in reality you know and, and they're all about all these jobs and stuff but I know people personally and, and it's not going to change their lives at all and they've just done it because they think it's better and it's not I don't think it is personally I don't think it is I feel like it's going downhill um, you know opportunities for the young kids it's going to be limited now and especially for the kids that are coming from out of the UK everybody's glad to get rid of it we don't want it in this country do we say? No, we don't. We don't need it. No. So a lot of the younger people that I spoke to uh, were a bit more anxious about leaving the EU. They were worried about what it meant for job opportunities and what it meant for them being able to travel. Uh, what, what do you think about it? What job opportunities? There is no jobs. They're, having, they're stopping on and they're stopping at college. They're paying £9,000 yeah. and they've no job to go to. There's no employment for anybody in the country, you know, so what they make, it's all fictitious what they're saying, you know. The young ones, they're all winking them. They're all winking them, that's all they're doing. You know, the young ones don't understand that of this day, like we understand it. We're old school. We know the score, but these young ones don't know it up to date, do they? I don't think the actual government know what they're doing about it. If they change their mind, more often they're just going to end up and we're going to lose a load of money. We're just going to be absolutely stuck. Uh, the, there is there's no money for the NHS. Uh, I feel as so though we've really been let down. We went in, it was all the promise of what was going to be good for England and I think they forgot the fact that when you're in a big European market, there's just so much 
that you rely on. I know the rules are sometimes stupid, but I think we're going to, I just think it's going to be a disaster actually. A recently leaked Brexit impact assessment said that Yorkshire and Humber in a no deal Brexit, which would mean leaving the customs union, would see a 7% dip in growth. So does that worry you or do you think it might be scaremongering? Uh, personally, it's scaremongering. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, reason, uh, reason I voted to leave, I have faith in our local businesses, I have faith in um, our country. Um, we've got so much diverse and so much uh, people uh, with the skills. Uh, I think we can manage it personally. Being in the market, it's, they tell you how much you can grow. If you go over that, you've got to let the vegetables and fruit rot. And when you think there's people going without, even in this country, that is bad. I agree with you. I think food wastage is disastrous. But one of the things that we've seen recently is that an organisation of farmers had to go to Michael Gove and say, hey, we've got a staffing crisis because immigration has fallen since we even just voted leave. How do you think that certain labour shortages, whether it's in agriculture or maybe the NHS, are going to be met once we leave the EU? Going back to the farms and that, the women, before we had all these foreigners working on the land, the women of the towns used to do it. They could still do it. Um, I worked on the farms with my mum and her friends. I mean, I'm not, I'm not discrimination about anybody, you know, but, you know, making all these different rules anyway. So, so it was the different rules, it was kind of being ruled from somewhere else, but when you're saying different things coming in, are you talking about immigration or are you talking about... Um, everything. I mean, I'm not discriminating anybody, but I mean, it was just everything. It was one thing on top of another, you know, it was like rules for this and rules for that. You know, as if, it was like putting this at the back as if we've no saying it, you know. So we were feeling the worst for it. So I feel that it's an open door to the European Union, uncontrolled, which allows criminals to enter this country from Eastern Europe and to rife the country through with crime that is now being unreported. Grooming in our country has not been reported fairly. Paedophilia has not been reported fairly. And this is down to the influx of criminals from Eastern Europe coming over and moving in with their criminal minds and their mindset. They are using England as a sweet shop to carry out their activities. So how high do you think EU migration is at the moment? I'd say it's very high at the moment. It's a lot higher than the figures that they suggested. I can't give you a definite figure, but I'd say to you, if you put down the figure that they mentioned about migration, they can give you recorded migration, the people that are settled here for jobs, double that, and you've more than likely got another double that are not even recorded and are not even on the system. So it's currently 90,000, which is a record low. You say it's a record low, but like I've just said there, how many of them are on the system that are not part of that 90,000? My point is, I'm not a uh, racist. Mm -hmm. My grandfather is from Kashmir. I serve in the British Army. I've lived here all my life. My sister's from Hong Kong. My other sister's from Singapore, my other two brothers from Richmond, North Yorkshire. So I'm far from racist. Yeah, I've got a very mixed family too. I guess I really disagree yeah. with you on the grooming stuff because the majority of uh, perpetrators of child sexual yeah. abuse are white British, the overwhelming no, I'm, majority. What, 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 what I would say there is that we don't need to point the figure or point the finger at what race is doing the grooming. But you said that first. No, I didn't. Eastern I said Europeans. Eastern Europeans, yes, because Eastern Europeans are over here and what they do is they proliferate in grooming people to go into prostitution. But isn't that pointing the finger? No, it isn't. It's not pointing the finger, it's stating a fact that is happening in this country. The police are aware of it. The only problem is, is that they cannot round them up and sort them out. You've got the Russians coming over here, the Eastern Europeans from Poland, from other blocks, Bulgaria, that are affiliating and using grooming to encourage prostitution. Wait, isn't this the plot of Taken? Taken what? With Liam Neeson? No, it's no plot whatsoever. It's a common thing that we see on TV. There has been another big change since Brexit. You also had Jeremy Corbyn 
defy a lot of people's expectations. How do you guys feel about Jeremy Corbyn? People say that young people love him. Jeremy Corbyn can suck my dick. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I hate the Labour Party because they've done fuck all. They used to be about the people and now they're not. They've done nothing for us. And they're, like I said about uni fees, if he's actually, you know, Mr Big Man, he needs to do something about it instead of just saying, oh, well, I don't want there to be uni fees. Do something about it. I want the funding to go to the NHS. Where's that gone? So he says that if he comes into power, one of the first things he'd do is get rid of tuition fees. Yeah. yeah, but pe people can say that and then, you know, so they can get to that higher level and then they'll just re reenact on the words, if you know what I mean. They can say that, they can say that they're going to, you know, do this and do that, but they're not going to, they're not going to do this and they're not going to do that. They can say it to get people on side, but as soon as he's like, got that power, it's not going to happen. Obviously, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, he, I think he's doing a world of good and I wish, I wish Labour did get voted in because I think maybe in that sense they... There'd have been a bit more changes, a lot, a lot better changes. Uh, I think he's a people's man, Corbyn. Yeah. I think he's a people's man. I think I could trust that man, but as far as the rest go, I don't know. I, I believe in that man, you know. He, he just, I've got that vibe with that fella. He's just that type of a fella. You can see he's truthful, but the rest of them, I couldn't say for them, you know, because they're just looking after themselves. They're lining their own pockets. He, He's, I think he's a people's person, is that man. I feel very positive about Jeremy Corbyn doing better than expected. I mean, he's at every single turn, he's, uh, he's proved it's, his success, which hasn't been easy. Um, you know, I, I'm a really big fan of Jeremy Corbyn, of the politics he stands for. Well, I hope he becomes Prime Minister. Um, like the candidate, depends who you ask. I think so, yes, because he, he makes a lot of sense. And if you look at, back at history, he's always been on the right side of history. Um, with his morals and how he acts and how he portrays himself as well. I went to Keithley and Bradford with a certain set of expectations. And everything that I'd read in both local and national press had told me to expect a constituency that was deeply divided along racial lines. I went armed with similar sort of questions as when I covered Brexit embarking, expecting to uncover a similar story of racial polarisation and mutual mistrust. And that's just not what I found at all. Every single person of colour who I spoke to, regardless of age, class background or political outlook, was remarkably chilled about race relations. In Barking, migrants were people who could steal your job and shirk the work all at the same time. But in yesterday's interviews, the migrant cut a much more mercurial figure. At once, cheap labour undercutting British agricultural workers. Also, an uh, out-of-touch and disinterested European elitist and, at the same time, a predatory sex offender who, for some reason, the Home Office just can't seem to deport. What makes such contradictory images stick isn't their factual basis, but how emotionally resonant they are. These politically charged fragments add up with media representations to build up a wider picture of a country which is no longer recognisable due to the insurgent forces from elsewhere taking over. And that was one of the strongest findings of the day, that Brexit is less about hope for the future than it is about reverence for the past. A golden age in which Britain is the plucky underdog, always going it alone and apparently didn't have any colonies because it was entirely self-sufficient. Nostalgia literally means homecoming and pain. And this is often translated as homesickness, which in this case would be a yearning for a distant and comforting past. But I also think that we should understand it as the pain of living at home. In a context of unemployment, limited educational opportunities, and chronically underfunded health and social care services, who can blame people for finding an imagined past much more appealing than the lived conditions of the present? For people who weren't enthused by Corbyn, politics remains something disconnected from their everyday lives and in some cases entirely forgettable. Not everyone thinks that political affiliation is particularly intrinsic to their sense of identity. And for some people, Corbyn was just another politician out to disappoint them. I guess after yesterday, I'm left feeling that Jeremy Corbyn has done a lot to normalise a progressive economic platform in this country. However, that hasn't yet done quite enough to displace the appeal of nationalism, nostalgia, or even straight-up nihilism. How you go about achieving that political culture shift, 
I don't know, but maybe you do. So share, comment, let me know on Twitter. I want to know what you think.